at the southern tip of the African continent, a tiny refuge making a huge impact. A concentration of life. Its varied habitats offering a sanctuary to some of the biggest animals on the planet. And some of the smallest. It's a story of beating the odds, of species coming back from the edge of extinction to reclaim their place in Africa's wilderness. This is De Hoer, place of hope. Daybreak over the Dehuip Nature Reserve. The morning mist reveals a herd of unique antelope. These are Bontebok, an Afrikaans name referring to their contrasting dark and white coats. The dew saturates the coastal succulent vegetation, supplying the Bontebok with all the water they need. It's a tranquil scene, and the antelope are calm and focused on their morning feed. But their presence here is a triumph of conservation. Less than a century ago, relentless hunting had left no more than 20 Bontebok in the world. But they were saved by a peculiar quirk. Bontebok cannot jump. Herded into fenced camps by concerned landowners and unable to escape by jumping over the fences, Bontebok numbers slowly recovered. It was the start of a trend that transformed this small part of the world into a conservation zone for nearly extinct animals. In 1957, the De Hoop Nature Reserve was set up as an experimental wildlife protection area where rare and endangered species could be nurtured and their numbers brought back from the brink to repopulate surrounding areas. Now, a part of a World Heritage Site and with an important marine protected area off its coast, De Hoop is a beacon of conservation in southern Africa and a haven for vulnerable species. Today, Bontebok numbers have swelled to almost 4,000 and other species have found hope for survival. Duhur contains a number of habitats in one small area. From the coastal rocky shores to lowland fainbos and pristine wetlands. But its protection doesn't end at the shoreline. The bay is an internationally renowned sanctuary for some iconic marine giants. Southern right whales once hunted to near extinction, migrate here to carve. 
two vulnerable species, the Cape vulture and the Cape mountain zebra, are slowly gaining back lost ground. In the numbers game that underpins the survival of a species, this small reserve is making a big difference. Covering just 140 square miles, the Duhurp Nature Reserve could fit into Yellowstone Park 25 times. And yet, despite its size, it is packed with life, offering a home to hundreds of species. Part of this abundance is thanks to the concentration of habitats found in De Hoop, a factor of its unique geography. South of the reserve, the Hyunung Nest Refier, or Honey Nest River, flows into the sea at De Mont. This river sweeps vast amounts of sand into the ocean which the sea then pushes back on shore, creating majestic beaches and dunes. To the east, the coastline becomes rocky. Soft sandstone carved over millennia by the ocean and the weather creates a dramatic landscape. Here, flat rock platforms provide ideal hunting grounds for shorebirds. While rock pools give shelter to a variety of marine species. Inland, flat pastures of succulents and large expanses of low bush provide food and shelter for many of De Hoop's residents. Ocean, rocky shores, dunes, lakes, bush, and open pasture all packed into an area that extends just 10 miles inland. A thin band of sanctuary, offering hope to all the species that live here. As morning comes to De Hoop, the park's majestic giant seeks out its favorite pastures, the common earlunt, the second biggest antelope in the world. Earlunt are huge. They can weigh close to a ton and stand six feet at the shoulder. For the indigenous hunter-gatherers of southern Africa, they were a potent symbol of abundance and strength. The San people immortalized the Irland in many of their rock paintings and religious ceremonies. And it was an essential part of their coming of age and shamanistic trance dance rituals.
They are slow giants. Even when startled, they can barely reach a peak of 25 miles per hour, and they tire easily. What they lack in speed, however, they make up in strength. When threatened, an eland can leap 10 feet from a standing position. Eland are nomads and have adapted to many of Africa's challenging and diverse environments, helped in part by an incredible ability to survive on almost no water. They are sociable animals, forming large herds without being territorial. And they are content to graze near other species. But among themselves, hierarchies still need to be maintained. This large bull asserts himself through an extraordinary adaptation of his physiology, knee clicking. The unusual sound is made by tendons slipping over the bones in his front knees. The tendon vibrates like a string. The sound it produces presents a clear picture of his size and potential fighting capabilities to any challenges. The bigger and stronger an adult bull, the deeper and more imposing his knee clicks. Yelant are browsers, nibbling juicy shoots and leaves off small trees and bushes. But a feast like this comes at a price. As the antelope presses against trees and bushes, ticks are brushed off onto him, burrowing into his hair and latching onto his back for a tasty blood meal. Once a tick attaches, the elant won't feel it growing fat on its blood. But other irritants lie frustratingly just out of reach of his teeth or tongue. Luckily, he has two very useful tools, his long, elegant back scratches. The Irland's spiral horns are a throwback to an ancient Asian ancestor that had four horns. Over time, the two pairs fused together intertwining into the corkscrew we see today. Still, there are only so many spots he can reach. And mercifully, he has help on board. Cattle egrets are a species of heron. They get their name from their behavior of traveling on or near large grazers, such as cattle, antelope, and zebra. Moving with the herd means access to an endless supply of juicy ticks. Still, scoring dinner can be a challenge. Their moving dinner table comes with heavy hooves and swishing tails. A slow, blood-filled tick is a treat for an egret. But this opportunistic feeder is here for a bigger bonanza. Insects, spiders, frogs, and worms that are churned up in the soil as the herds tug up tussocks to eat. 
following browsers and grazers offers big rewards for little effort. Parasites don't only affect the park's big antelope. They'll latch onto any large animal that's passing by. In this case, the largest bird in the world, the ostrich. A young male enjoys a satisfying dust bath, getting rid of clinging parasites and stripping excess oil off his feathers. He's not alone for long. It's his mate wanting her own quality time in the bath. They lie on the ground, swaying from side to side, with their wings spread wide for maximum coverage. A good dust bowl is a valuable commodity. While two is company in this bath, three is definitely a crowd. The tallest and heaviest living bird, male ostriches, can tower at almost 10 feet and weigh up to 330 pounds. Their giant size makes flight impossible. But they have adapted by becoming extremely fast runners. Long, powerful legs allow ostriches to sprint at up to 43 miles an hour with strides of more than 10 feet. Elite sprinters need special footwear and ostrich are no different. Most birds have three or even four toes on each foot, but the ostrich has only two. The inner toes are tipped with long, curving claws that dig into the ground like spikes on a sprinter's shoe. This claw is also used for self-defense. High up above them, as the sun gathers strength and the day heats up, a fleeting glimpse of one of de Huip's greatest conservation successes. The Cape Vulture. One of the biggest vultures in Africa, its wingspan measures up to eight feet. Some 200 of these reclusive scavengers have made their home in the Potberg Mountains that border De Hoop, comprising the last remaining colony in this area. Over the years, their numbers have plunged due to loss of habitat, power lines, and poison from carcasses left out by farmers to kill other scavengers, like jackals. By the 1970s, just 30 vultures remained alive in this area. But thanks to a shift in the attitudes of local farmers and the sanctuary offered by De Hoop, the number of these elusive scavengers continues to climb. provides a haven for many bird species, but the region as a whole is also an essential habitat for bird life.
beyond the western boundary of the park, greater flamingos use this estuary to feed, preparing themselves for their migrations northwards after the rainy season. When the time comes, they will fly these 600 miles to blooming deserts in Namibia and Botswana. If the rains have been good, they will breed there. If not, they will come all the way back to this region. The flamingos are tucking in. They are filter feeders, and here they have plenty to eat. The sand flats in the wetlands near Duhurp are full of microscopic algae and bacteria, organic matter that clings to individual grains of sand. It's also a feast for these globular mud snails. The algae and bacteria make the sediment particularly rich in small crustaceans and marine worms, and the flamingos are taking full advantage. They're on the move, sieving through the sediment for the tastiest morsels. When they find a particularly good spot, they will work it over thoroughly, slowly pivoting around in a circle to dig through the sediment. As the tide retreats, their circular excavations leave behind a neat bit of landscaping, a small island, briefly wrestled over by a pair of hermit crabs. In the west, the shore is a sandy expanse, but just a few miles away on the eastern edge of the park, this is a transformed coast. This is a harsher, more demanding environment where waves break on a rugged and rocky shore. It seems inhospitable to all, except for the toughest limpets and mussels. But for this bird, it's perfect. The African black oyster catcher is another living symbol of the success of De Hoer. Found only in southern Africa, its numbers had fallen to below 5,000 by the early 1980s. African black oyster catchers build their nests on the ground, which makes them extremely vulnerable. From marauding pets to off-road vehicles, encroaching human activity almost doomed this charismatic resident of the rocky shore. But protected coasts like this offer a safe space to these birds. Still, life here isn't easy. The oyster catcher is restricted to a narrow and dangerous strip of land, the intertidal zone. Surviving here, avoiding pounding waves, takes speed and skill. It feeds at low tide when the shellfish on these rocks have been exposed. A specially adapted bill and powerful neck muscles allow it to grab a mussel quickly and to tear it free from its mooring of fibers. A speedy getaway is essential. 
The waves here are powerful, and even a fraction of a second could prove costly to a bird caught in the surging breakers. Safe from the ocean, it gets to work on its catch. His mate has also been successful. She's jabbed a limpet off its rock and is carving out its soft meat with her bill. It's hard, tiring work. And to sustain themselves, adult birds need to crack open and eat scores of these armored morsels. With plentiful food and a protected park around them, De Hoop's oyster catchers are thriving, swelling the numbers of this threatened species. As the tide comes in, the oyster catchers retreat. have to wait for the next low tide to eat again. But for other inhabitants of the De Hoop coast, it's feeding time. A marine protected area declared in 1986 extends for three miles into the ocean off De Hoop. This allows fish species to thrive here, close to the coast largely untouched by overfishing in this ocean. At high tide, many species of native fish move into the shallow water to feed. And as the rock pools fill up with marine life, they become an ideal hunting ground for one of this coast's most cunning predators the octopus. This highly intelligent animal preys on crabs and rock lobster. He moves easily between land and sea, searching for snacks between the rocks. De Hoop is full of conservation success stories. Out in the bay, the star of De Hoop's marine protected area is coming home to breed. The southern right whale, one of the rarest of all the planet's large whales. These giants have completed a long journey, leaving behind their feeding grounds in the icy waters off Antarctica and journeying north to the milder coasts of South America, Australia and Africa. They've come here to this protected coast to mate and to breed as part of the largest gathering of their species in the Southern Hemisphere. Half of all southern right calves born in Africa are born at De Hoop. They are priceless treasures, a new generation inching the species away from the threat of annihilation that loomed over it just 80 years ago. Their name reveals their grim history. Whalers named them right whales because they were targeted as the right whales to hunt. 
These docile and intelligent animals were obvious targets, and their high fat content made them an easy haul as they floated after being harpooned. For over 200 years, they were slaughtered on an industrial scale. And by 1935, when they became officially protected, fewer than 2,000 remained alive on the planet. But determined conservation efforts have now begun to pay off. Today, the population is estimated to be around 7,000 individuals in the southern oceans. And this figure is doubling about every decade. The dunes of De Hoop form a barrier between the ocean and the land. But this barrier is far more mobile than it looks. Huge volumes of sand brought down by rivers and then dumped onto the shore by the ocean are swept up these slopes. Abrasive and always in flux, it's a tough environment for life. But some species have made a home here. A Cape legless skink is in his element, living and feeding under the sand. On the plain, the park's iconic species has adapted to a more forgiving habitat. These Bontebok are starting to get down to the important business of the survival of the species. It's mating season and spirits are high. This female is ready to breed and the males are starting to show off for her. A young male sprints through a neighbor's territory displaying his prowess. He's been noticed by the females, but he's also been seen by the resident male. It's a deliberate provocation to the established male's dominance, and it can't go unchallenged. Bontebok showdowns are usually more about displaying bravado than locking horns. But sometimes, exceptions have to be made, and young pretenders need to be put in their place. It's a test of strength rather than a duel to the death. Their horns are for wrestling, not stabbing. The bout is over. The challenger has been put in his place and plods away to try his luck with a less experienced sparring partner. The winner has secured his territory and with it, the females of his harem. Despite his victory, courting is still required. He approaches the female, nose outstretched, head low and tail lifted, a Bontebok proposal. If she is impressed, she will allow him to sniff her to see if she's ready to mate. Their courting is a delicate ritual of advance and retreat.
clueless male is so intrigued by his potential mate that another opportunistic suitor has snuck in unseen. He escorts the newcomer off the premises. At the edge of the pasture, a flash of black and white. But these are no ordinary zebras. These are Cape Mountain zebra. Found only in South Africa, they are another de Hoop success story. Great climbers with hard pointed hooves perfectly adapted to walking on rocky slopes, they generally live in mountainous regions up to six and a half thousand feet above sea level. But their need for a rich variety of grazing and plentiful water put them in direct competition with humans. By the 1950s, there were fewer than 100 zebras left alive. Now, thanks to national parks and reserves such as De Hoop, the current global population of Cape Mountain zebra is estimated to be around 1,500. There is hope that De Hoop's zebras will in future be able to swell herds beyond the park. De Hoop is a sanctuary, and the larger species that thrive here are free from predators. But down under their hooves, another world exists, where small but lethal hunters stalk their prey. A baby Cape Cobra ventures out from his shelter a prince in waiting. First though, it will have to grow to its full length of almost five feet, shedding its skin as it grows. While he's still small, dangers are all around. As an adult, he will be treated with much more respect, feared as one of Africa's most dangerous snakes. Now, though, he needs to avoid being trampled by the park's bigger residents. When it comes to poison, however, size doesn't always equal danger. An endangered cape burrowing scorpion on high alert. It's getting ready to defend itself from an intruder. Fearsome looking stingers stab and parry like swords, but although they can land a vicious strike, these are not very poisonous. Scorpions have two weapons, their venomous stinger and their claws. Less poisonous scorpions need two bigger, stronger claws to kill their prey and see off rivals. The black creeping scorpion looks deadly, but its massive claws reveal that its sting is probably relatively mild. A passing woodlouse 
shows scant respect for the armored beast. The soil of De Hoop is largely sandy and chalky. And yet, this nutrient-poor soil is a perfect home for one of the planet's most threatened and diverse plant realms. The planet is divided into six so-called floristic kingdoms, areas in which similar plant species tend to grow. The Cape Floral Kingdom is not only the smallest, but it's also the most diverse. 3% of all the planet's plant species growing in an area the size of the US state of Maine. Comprising 80% of this diverse plant life is Feinbos. This is not a single species, but rather a type of vegetation encompassing a variety of species. Moving through this world of flowers, a tiny hunter. A flower mantis waits patiently for a passing victim. One of the reserve's smallest creatures is connected to its biggest. Like the Irland, revered as a deity by the sand hunters of southern Africa, the mantis was the sand people's supreme god, the trickster deity Kagan. It was believed that it was Kagan who created the Irland. Success. But he's bitten off more than he can chew. The caterpillar is inedible, protected by a chemical secretion. Down below, Another possible meal scuttles nearer, a juicy cockroach. But the mantis knows that this too is off the menu. The cockroach shoots out a highly toxic fluid when threatened. Largely untouched by predators, it has free reign over this scrubby wilderness. It's time for the mantis to find a better hunting spot. Soon, another quarry comes into range. Camouflaged on its flower, the mantis lets the wind nudge it closer and closer to its victim. A hearty meal for a small, but ferocious predator. In the afternoon, the mythical creations of the mantis god are on the move, looking for fresh pastures. It's a stately caravan, and a couple of ostriches have joined in. Young Irland tend to stay together, forming an informal nursery at the rear of the procession. Another generation of Irland growing up in safety, their futures secure. Nearby, living symbols of the success of De Hoop, a Bontebok cow and her calf. For now, she is entirely dependent on her mother. But after a year, she will move away from her herd, striking out on her own to join another group and start her own family in one of the world's greatest conservation stories. Dusk falls on the southern tip of the African continent.
the Eland and Bontebok are settling down for the night. Out in the bay, baby whales press close to their mothers. Tomorrow, it will all begin again. A new day in a place offering new hope.